our theme this week is Journeys of Hope. And my first reaction was, oh good, I get to speak on Proverbs, which is all about the journey of life. Life is a journey, isn't it? And I wasn't uh, overly disappointed to be asked to speak on Paul, um, but it's an interesting theme because so much of scripture is telling us about a journey. And Proverbs, for example, is full of words to do with traveling, walking, running, stumbling, keeping within the way or not going out of the way, the road of life, if you like. And we will see that, and we've seen that to some degree, of course, already with our first study of Brother John with Moses, his journey of life. The other problem with the subject, if you like, is, as Brother John has acknowledged, we both have too much information. There is a vast amount of information about the Apostle Paul. And it was a big challenge for me to think about how to approach the subject. What do you include and what you don't include? I've partly overcome that by using some slides. Uh, the older technology of handouts works as well. But what I've decided to do was choose five themes, and you may or may not have detected the details in the announcement or the program, that today I want to speak about God's providence. That's, that's today's theme. I will try to keep roughly chronological with Paul's life, because I think that might be helpful, and there's no reason not to. My last preamble comment is to say that I've never spoken to an audience like this before in my life. We're all old people. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it sort of struck me uh, as I was thinking about preparing these talks as to, well, I can't give a normal talk. I, I can't speak to an audience that's made up of everyone from zero to a hundred or whatever. And where, as a speaker, you get used to a certain style because you recognise there's this great diversity in your audience. This is a much more specialised audience. And in terms of general Bible knowledge, exceptionally high. For that reason too, I, I'm not going to get to, too bogged down in a detailed analysis of chapter by chapter through Acts or, or any particular epistle of Paul. That's something you either are familiar with or is fairly easy to find yourself. We just read Paul's own comments in Galatians 1 that when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me now, I don't know where Paul got that idea in the sense that who told him that God had separated him from his mother's womb for this role in his life? I assume it was by revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ, as so many things in his life were. What an astounding thing. We don't know his age, as we do with Moses, but it may not have been much different, in fact. Moses was 40, Paul probably in his 30s, somewhere around there, when he was called by the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And to become aware, as he must have at some point, not long after, I assume, that God had in fact marked him out from before his birth for this role would have been an astounding revelation. You think that's pretty amazing? And it is. I wonder if you've realised the same is true of you. The Apostle himself in Ephesians says, According as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children 
by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Every single one of us has not only been called by God in the sense of calling us to baptism, but we were chosen before the foundation of the world. And that's an extraordinary thought, is it not? We will develop this more if you're still finding that a little hard to, to absorb momentarily. The same was true, of course, of the Lord himself. Hebrews 1 says that God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. We're not going to into the Greek to sort out the more accurate translation. That's not necessary. But what is clear is that when we read Genesis 1 and then link it with Psalm 8 and Hebrews 2, that as this statement of Hebrews 1 says, the Lord was in the mind of God on the first week of creation, if not earlier. And all of that before sin even entered the world. The Lord was not an afterthought. God was not surprised when sin entered the world. And he then had to scratch his head, as it were, to say, well, now what do I do? It's all gone wrong. Um, oh, I know, I'll, I'll, I'll provide a saviour. And he'll, I know, he'll be my son. That'll be a good idea. That might be how we would have handled that situation, but it's not how Almighty God did it. And there are so many other examples in Scripture as well. So we have Esau and Jacob. We know called to certain roles in life before they were born. We've got the example of Jeremiah. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. We have other examples. John the Baptist, again. All of these examples are people who were divinely appointed, as we all were. And if that's the only thing that sunk in this morning, that would be extraordinarily valuable to all of us, I'm sure. To bear about in our minds every day of our lives the fact that God has called us to be precisely where we are and who we are right now. And so I want to explore before we come to Paul in a more detail in a moment, a little more this concept of providence. My definition for today at least is I'm talking about the care and benevolent guidance of God. That God has a purpose with every single one of us and, of course, with the wider world and the universe as a whole. So we read, for example, that God created the universe. Psalm 33 talks about it being by his word. He just said the words and there was the universe just by a spoken word. We read, for example, in, in Matthew 5 and other places, that the weather is under his control. Sometimes we have, find it a bit mysterious as to what he's doing with our weather from time to time, but the scriptures tells us that. Jesus himself, of course, says that he sends the rain on the just and the unjust. He sends the rain, is the point. It didn't just happen because there was an evaporation out in the ocean and the currents of the air moved it across and it hit a mountain and condensed and fell down. Yes, that's the scientific explanation. But it happened because God made it happen. And we're told that frequently in scripture. And so too we know that the nations, Daniel's the obvious quotation here, the nations are under his control. However we stupid we may think our government at any governed particular time might be, they're operating under the will of God. And out of some disastrous situations, some awful situations, God is working his will. 
and nothing is a surprise to him. He's not caught unawares by a situation and then struggles to resolve it. He is totally in control. Then, of course, we get a little closer to home. The ecclesia is equally under his control. Uh, so the, just uh, one of those examples in Revelation 1, you know that it describes there the Son of Man walking amongst the lampstands. Here, right now. It's as if the Lord is walking up and down the centre aisle of this room right now guiding in some way everything according to the will of God. There is nothing that will happen to you personally, to us collectively, that is outside of his control or purpose. We read so often in scripture, Matthew 6 is a, is a very useful example, familiar to us, about how God provides for our daily needs. And it's in that context that we have the Lord's Prayer and we pray for bread for the day. Or do we? I suspect many of us are praying for the bread for next year. Or in fact, bread for the next decade. We're anxious that our superannuation fund will still be there. That isn't the way God describes our position in life at all. In fact, this is probably, in the last 50 years, the first time in history that anyone has ever been able to accumulate such wealth for their retirement as this generation. We have, therefore, to overcome this prejudice that we have in our minds, that this is something we should expect, and if it's not there, we complain. That was never true in the past. You simply asked God to provide for the food for the day. Not for tomorrow, and not for next year either. So our physical needs are looked after, but so are our spiritual needs. Uh, let's just look at one example here. Uh, the last one, 2 Corinthians 4, just to illustrate the point. To keep you turning your Bible over to keep a bit of concentration as well. If you're anything like me, it's helpful. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 15. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. And you know the context, no doubt. That he's talking about the good and the bad, if you like. The, all the circumstances of life, they are all for our sakes, planned and organised and implemented by the will of God. Now I hear someone say, in my mind, what about time and chance? Well, come with me to Ecclesiastes and see what this passage actually does say. One of the things that's impressed me, again, is the need to be very careful in reading the scriptures. And maybe like myself, you've discovered that sometimes we read things that aren't there. Read into them things that aren't there. So, first of all, let's just read the familiar verse, Ecclesiastes 9.11. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favour to men of skill. But time and chance happeneth to them all. And it goes on in a similar vein. And a natural inclination is, of course, to read that in our English as meaning, well, but there's things outside of God's control. There are things that happen that are what we call accidents. that has nothing to do with God whatsoever. Well, that's not easy to reconcile with the rest of Scripture. That may give you some peace of mind. You may be able to relax a little and say, well, I can't see how God could have been involved in this event in my life so I will deal with that problem by saying he wasn't. If that was my understanding of God I'm not sure I'd be here. 
I'm not sure I would still be a follower of God at all. If I was to worship a God who left me to my own devices from time to time, or indeed most of the time, I would feel terrified. But that's just me. Let's have a closer think about this. Ecclesiastes has a lot to say about the word time. It's, it's perhaps one of the theme words of the whole of this book. And you know from chapter 3, if you just flick back there, the whole of the first half of this chapter is all about time. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Now, and we're not going through all those verses. We don't need to. What that is telling us is that these times are not random. This is not the meaning of the word. Ecclesiastes 3 plainly tells us that these events are not random. They're planned. But what about the word chance? Well, it's not a very common word in the Hebrew scriptures. So just come with me just for a moment to Isaiah. There's a couple of examples in Isaiah which I think might surprise you if you haven't noticed this before. There are some examples where it's translated other than chance or chance, depending on where you're from. I'm never quite sure because I grew up in Melbourne. Now I live in Adelaide. I get my accents wrong, mixed up. Isaiah 53, you know what this chapter is all about. Without me turning to the verse, where is there any chance in Isaiah 53? There's none. It's an absolute impossibility. Where is it? It's in verse 6. Or we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath... Look at the margin if you've got a standard King James Oxford Bible. The Lord hath made the iniquity of us all to meet, it's that word, meet, on him. That's no chance event. And there's another one in chapter 64, verse 5, while we're here. Isaiah 64, verse 5. Here it's translated meet. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee in thy ways, behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned in those in continuance, and we shall be saved. This is in the context of God's redemptive work. God meets us to redeem us. And the one in Genesis 32 is the angels met Jacob. There was no chance event. None of these other references imply anything such as we conjure up in the word translated chance. I don't believe there is such a thing in our lives. Well, that's enough provocation for a moment. Let's move on and think about the first century. One of the things that is not difficult to realise is that wherever we go in the New Testament, in whatever place in the Roman Empire that we happen to be, there's usually some Jews there. Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, there were Jews from all sorts of places all come to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, as we know. And so, whenever the apostles went out to a place, there were usually a lot of Jews there, and in fact, in most cases, a big enough congregation to form a synagogue. This is a very significant preparation for the coming of the gospel. This happened hundreds of years earlier, particularly from Alexander the Great's time onwards, where Jews were, by policy of governments, spread around the Roman Empire. Why? Well, to form the basis of the first century ecclesias. That's why. It wasn't just a whim of a government that God just said, oh, well, you can do what you like. I'm not interested in that. This was all providentially arranged. 
Jews were approximately 7% of the population of the Roman Empire. It's been estimated that there were 5.6 million Jews in the empire out of a total of 60 million people. That's an interesting number, 5.6 million, isn't it? Because you connect that with the Holocaust being of a similar order. What's also become apparent is that by the time the apostles were travelling around, that there were many Gentiles who'd become converted to Judaism. They're called proselytes. Or perhaps they hadn't quite gone the whole hog, as we sometimes use the expression. They hadn't fully adopted Judaism. They're called in the Greek the God-fearers. They're partial converts. They're often described as sitting at the door. They're not in the synagogue, but they're listening. And the men amongst them have not got to the point of choosing to be circumcised. They haven't fully taken on board Judaism, but they recognise there's something in it. Then when we come to look more specifically at the Jewish people, it's been estimated that 85% of the Jews lived in the diaspora, which is pretty amazing. It's probably not too dissimilar today. They didn't, most of the Jews weren't in Israel at all. 85% of them were somewhere else. And so it's been estimated that therefore only 850,000 Jews lived in the land and about 30,000 of those lived in Jerusalem. So there's this huge reservoir of people who knew the Old Testament out there in the Roman Empire, ready, so to speak, to hear the gospel. What's more, again, sometime beforehand, the Old Testament had been translated into the Greek language, the Septuagint. Again, that's just my accent. Brother John's got another one. Whatever its correct, correct pronunciation is, I don't know. What an incredible thing. All of these circumstances underpinning the first century. Nobody would have perceived that this was anything other than time and chance to use that expression. But it wasn't. These were all providential arrangements falling into place by the will of God. And so on top of that, there was the very significant Roman law prevailing right across the same territory, which established peace and freedoms that were quite extraordinary. And so we can summarise that by looking at these three aspects, and they're just three. There was the common Greek language, not interestingly, the Roman language. You might have surmised from a human point of view that the common language would be Roman because it's the Roman Empire after all. But no, Greek was the common language. And then you had a system of roads which the Apostle Paul travelled on frequently. And there was a very powerful Roman navy which meant that he could travel by boat too and not be at great risk, although some risk, of piracy. Uh, there was some people of like there is today who are not law-abiding, but generally speaking, it was an easy environment in which to travel and to be able to preach the gospel. And all of that had been a building up for some hundreds of years in the providence of God. Now, just to digress for a moment, that's not the only time in history where such an arrangement has occurred. One occurred 200 years ago. 200 years ago, almost to the day, almost to the year I should say, somebody invented a steam engine. It was the year 1805. Quote unquote, coincidentally the year Brother Thomas was born. And they figured out that you could harness the power of the steam engine, you could put it into a locomotive. And you could travel faster than a horse for the first time in history. You could harness it to a boat and you could go into a headwind. You weren't dependent on the weather anymore to travel across the seas or rivers. And somebody else decided to hook it up to a printer. And instead of printing whatever the figures were, one page every second, through sort of mechanical hand-operated printer, 
you could now print a hundred, a thousand. And so for the first time in history, and 200 years ago, the, set was, the world stage was set to allow people like John Thomas not just to read his Bible and figure out what the fundamental truths of our beliefs are, but print them cheaply and travel easily and fast and relatively cheaply and spread that message such a, in such a way that it had not been possible for hundreds and hundreds of years beforehand. And so we do have a wonderful God, a remarkable God, who hasn't just foreseen everything, but has planned everything and is making it all unfold according to his will. And so we now need to look a bit more closely at Paul's life because his preparation, as he himself said in Galatians 1, was not accidental. The first picture that you saw there today is a picture of the modern city of Tarsus with a, a very attractive environment on that slide of a river flowing through the town. It was always a prosperous city. He grew up in this town in the province of Cilicia in modern Turkey, a point which he makes a number of times. And I suppose I can do something similar in the sense that I don't mind telling you I was born in Oxford, and that's why I'm so clever, of course. Um, some of us are not particularly proud of where we were born, but he clearly saw that as something worthy of statement. It wasn't irrelevant. It was, had something to do with who he was. It had something to do with why he was the person he was. Not everything, but something to do with that. It was important to understand him in his wholeness, to be aware that he was born in Tarsus. And he tells us quite a bit more. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3. We have probably one of the most detailed statements, just a few or in fact, just two verses, that tells us so much about himself. Philippians chapter 3, verse 5. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the ecclesia, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Well, there's a lot of information there. Obviously, the fact that he's of the tribe of Benjamin is, is the one, first one I want to highlight there. So what? So what he is from Benjamin? Does it matter? Well, in one sense, you could say it doesn't matter any more than it matters where I was born or what particular tribe, if you like, I came from. But in some ways, it does. We are the product of our environment and of our upbringing. And we might pretend that we're not. We might like to think, well, no, we're, where we were born and where we grew up and what our family was like has got nothing to do with who I am. I am a child of God and, and none of these things influence me, whatever. Well, I'm sorry you've been so sadly deluded if that's what you think. We'll develop this thought later as well. We are for good and evil, a product of our environment. And we need to come to grips with that, and he certainly did here. And he didn't say this in a boastful sense. He, in effect, was saying, well, they were important parts of my early life, but in fact, they were a great impediment to me. And we need to be able to do that too. We need to look at our lives and say, well, yes, we're very thankful, for example, in my case, that I was brought up in a Christadelphian home. But my wife, Diane, can't say that. So is it something to value or isn't it? And you've got to think it through. You've got to weigh up what all of these influences on our lives really mean. And so we've got some other things. In Acts, we're told he's a tent maker. You might say, well, you don't need to know that either. Well, we actually do, don't we? It's in the scriptures. We do need to know. For some reason, it's got to be understood. He was sent to Jerusalem from Tarsus as a boy 
possibly 11 or 12, that some people think may have been the age he went, to learn from Gamaliel. Now, he wasn't just any old teacher. He was the grandson of Hillel, a very famous Jew, who was the president of the Sanhedrin a couple of generations earlier. This Gamaliel was a very famous man. And he doesn't say that because, well, that means I'm smart, and therefore you must listen to what I say. He's saying, you need to understand my background. I need to understand my background, he's saying too. And he adds that he's a Pharisee. We saw that there in Philippians. And that was by no means something he was proud of. Not at all. But it's all part of his background, who he was. And we need to do the same. He witnessed the execution of Stephen, for which he bitterly regretted for the rest of his life. And, of course, was a fanatical persecutor. He mentions this over and over again. And it was in our reading in Galatians. All of these things are who the Apostle Paul was that he believed was necessary not only for him to understand and reflect upon, but for all of us to do the same. And of course, with all of that build-up, he then is confronted, as he says in Corinthians, and last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. What an extraordinary event of which there is really no comparison. I mean, there are comparisons. I shouldn't say there's none. There's certainly nothing quite like that. There's a sense in which Moses at the bush had a kind of similar confrontation. But Moses had a reasonable understanding of who God was at that stage. Saul was going headlong against the will of God, and he was a blissfully ignorant of it. Some have speculated that maybe some doubts had begun to work in his mind at this stage, but I, I don't like to get into too much speculation. It's not helpful. What is interesting about the conversion on the road to Damascus is that we have three records of that event. So, first of all, in Acts 9, the actual record of the occurrence Christ's commission to Paul, or Saul as he's still called at this stage, first of all was Christ to Ananias. He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Not exactly a good job description, is it? Not something you would say, yeah, oh, oh, I'll take this job, thanks, that'll be good. <laughs> reminds me of the John's description of Moses this morning. Not something that human nature would say, yep, that's, I'll, I'll do that. I'd love to suffer for thy name's sake. <laughs> well, we have a second record of this commission of Ananias to Saul. In Acts 22, in rehearsing this record, Paul says what Ananias had said to him obviously reflecting what Christ had said to him. The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth, for thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. So this is now the second time the commission is being stated. And then there's Christ's own words to the Apostle twice. Chapter 22, first of all, it only says, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. But then a more extensive statement in Acts 26, he tells us what the Lord said in similar words, that he is to go to the Gentiles. Now, given that he was all of the things we've seen born of Tarsus, of the tribe of Benjamin, a tent maker, sent to Jerusalem to be taught by Gamaliel, a Pharisee, a witness of the execution of Stephen and a fanatical persecutor of Christians. 
He's the last person on the planet you would naturally assume is going to be chosen to take the gospel to the Gentiles. But such is the way of God. Who would have thought God would choose you of all people? Or me, of course, of all people. What, what did he see in us? Out of all of the people of this country or the world, what on earth did we have as, that equipped us and qualified us to be one of God's children? Well, practically nothing of Paul's background appears to make him suitable as an apostle to the Gentiles. Maybe you could have chosen someone who might have been a Gentile convert to Judaism, would have been a, perhaps a more suitable person, wouldn't he? That way he'd at least understand the Gentiles being one and he would understand Judaism having been a convert. That would be a far better choice, wouldn't it? And there'd be people far more suitable for being the children of God than you, wouldn't there? Well, no. We've been chosen before the foundation of the world. And it might be a mystery to you, it might be a mystery to me too, as to why you were called, or why I was called, but such is the way of God. And the preparation of Paul's life goes on. We read in Galatians, let's go, just, just hold that chapter open because um, we won't look at the other references by turning them up. In Galatians 1, we're told that he went into Arabia. I'm not going to get into a discussion or debate with anyone afterwards about what the sequence of events here were. I think we're a bit like the Jews. They say that if you get three Jews together, you've got four opinions. Um, well, I think the same with us probably in some ways. And we could have long debates over whether he went immediately into Arabia or whether he stayed in Damascus and then went to Arabia. It doesn't matter for this purpose. It probably doesn't matter at all. But at least at some point he went into Arabia, wherever that was. Well, that's an interesting thing to do. You've just been commissioned to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Surely, surely you would get on the next camel or whatever off to the nearest Gentile city and start preaching, wouldn't you? You'd probably even say, well, I've got to go to Rome first. That's the capital of the Roman Empire, the Gentile Empire that exists. I must, surely that's what I've got to do. Well, he went to Arabia. And it's, as far as we know, nothing happened. Just went in, as we say in this country, went bush, went walkabout. Well, he did go into Damascus, not only for his baptism, but of course he did stay there, and possibly for a couple of years. It's a bit hard to be certain about this. It's uh, mentioned in verses 17 and 18. Verse 18 says, after three years, so perhaps all of that's, a mixture of that's been in Arabia and Damascus. So three years later, he went up to Jerusalem for 15 days, we're told in verse 18. That's all. And then we discover he's in Tarsus. And he's probably been there 10 years. What's he doing in Tarsus for 10 years? And we never even hear of an ecclesia in Tarsus. I, I think there probably was one, but it's not mentioned. And for all we know, he could have been doing nothing. What happened to the commission? Had he decided he didn't want this job after all and handed in his resignation? Well, no, obviously not, but what's going on here? And perhaps to give you some idea of what I think the time sequence is, that's pretty rough. Um, I'm not, not absolutely super skilled in this PowerPoint stuff, but it's the best I could do. There appears to be a period in the yellow, in the, the big block there, of about 10 years where Saul lived in Tarsus. And we hear nothing whatever about what went on at that time. 
And it was at the end of that time, as we read in Galatians 2.1, 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas because Barnabas had gone to see him and said, hey, Saul, we need your help. And do you find life sometimes like that? Might not be 14 years, it could be four, it could be 40, it doesn't matter. Where finally something falls into place and you think, well, hang on, this is very inefficient, isn't it? Surely God could have arranged things more efficiently than he has. Why has it taken so long for the commission to finally start? Well, there's no answer. It's just the way of God. I want you to think of some other examples. Think of Joseph. <clears throat> probably for 13 years after he'd had the visions of the sun, moon and stars and of the wheat sheaves, clearly telling him that he's going to rise to become the most prominent member of the family. And where is he? In prison in Egypt. Well, maybe we might speculate, well, he perhaps had to learn some humility. So maybe God thought it would be a good idea to send him down there just to pull his head in a bit for a while. I don't think that's the case. But you see, we do that, don't we? We say that of one another. We perhaps say it of ourselves sometimes. Oh, well, that was for your good. That, that was to help you learn this or that. Very dangerous thing to speculate on especially about someone else. It's not too bad to do it for yourself. Maybe this happened to me to teach me a lesson. That may be useful. It may be correct, but it may be wrong too. Never, ever, ever try to make that judgment about anyone else. Well, we've this morning been reminded of Moses, haven't we? How long was he wondering what to do? I could have put 80 years on there, but it's tr both true. Why was he 40 before he tried to explain to his people that he was their redeemer? Why not 30? Why not 20? Why wait till he's 40? Well, it wasn't just he who waited till he was 40, because, I'll go back, sorry. Um, it was another 40 years before the exodus occurred. He was off in Midian looking after sheep. What a waste of time. I mean, if, how many more Hebrews have been beaten to death in Egypt while that 40 years ticked over and over and over? Surely God could have done something better than that. Surely he could have intervened much quicker and saved all that grief. And surely he could have spared you your grief. But no, this is the way of God. David, anointed, not just a dream, anointed king of Israel. And where does he spend most of the next 20 years? Hunted like an animal in the wilderness by Saul and his army. What's going on here? And then, most remarkable of all, our Lord himself. Why wait until he's 30 before he started his ministry? Couldn't he have started at 20, 25? And why only minister for three and a half years? What a waste of his life. He could have done so much more good if he'd been a minister for 10 years. How many more people he could have healed? How many more people could he have touched their hearts and brought them to God? If, if God had been a little more efficient, started him earlier and given him a longer ministry. But no, this is the way of God.
So what about our preparation? What is God doing in our lives? Some of us come to the gospel very late in life. Why? Why somehow didn't God work in our life a bit earlier? And maybe our contribution in the family of God could have been greater. Some of us, by whatever reason, maybe a disability, cannot do very much, cannot serve in some notable way. And we may feel that we're not contributing much. Um, I remember once I gave an exhort at an ecclesia where there was a brother in a wheelchair in the audience who was not far off death. And he talked to me afterwards and with tears said he felt useless couldn't do anything anymore and I said honestly you being here is a greater exhortation to me than anything I've said this morning some of us seem to have more difficulties in this life than others There's no penalties for going over time. That was not mentioned in the announcement, so there's no, I don't have to put a donation in the box. So I, I must just give you one little anecdote. I don't know if this is true or not. I read it, and it's a lovely story. Apparently there was a synagogue in Poland before the Holocaust in what's called the Pale, where the rabbi got sick and tired of everyone telling him about their problems. And so he said to them one day, when you go home from this Sabbath meeting, I want you to think about all of your problems and when you come back next Sabbath, I want you to come back with a sack with rocks in it and on each rock you write one of your problems. And of course they all came next Sabbath with these huge bags of rocks over their shoulders and he said, now I want you to put them all across the front here with your name on the bag. Now after the service is finished, you're all to come and pick up somebody else's bag and have their problems. Because you reckon yours are the worst. You reckon you've got more problems than anyone else. Well, you come and pick someone else's bag this time and you'll have their problems instead of yours. And everyone took their own bag home. <laughs> <clears throat> Good story, whether it's true or not. We do sometimes feel, and we may observe of others, that they seem to have a rough life, difficult life. And that may be so. But every single experience of our life is part of our training for the kingdom. Everything. Absolutely everything that's ever happened or ever will happen in our lives is training us, equipping us, preparing us for the kingdom. And I like this quote from Islip Collie, as I do so many of his comments. Our life is mainly made up of insignificant events, little vexations and trials of patience, little duties and causes of weariness. There are opportunities every day for the development of Christian character and the application of Christian discipline just because every day brings its trials. Thank you.